Well, thank you very much. It's uh, it really is a pleasure to be able to come and speak to you. Um, my as is, uh, my name is Glenn Bergeron, obviously, and uh, I'm a professor at the University of of Winnipeg in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Applied Health. Uh, by profession, I'm an athletic therapist, uh, and uh, so I we uh, I treat. I'm, I'm the director of the athletic therapy program at the University of Winnipeg, and I also in uh, teach there and I'm in the clinic as well. So I see uh, clinical people, uh, uh, patients in our clinic two days a week or have been until we close down. And now actually we're trying to do things uh, somewhat by telehealth. <clears throat> we do a fair amount of, uh, I do a fair amount of presentations uh, in this regard. Um, this particular topic that we've done, I was just saying just before we started uh, that I've done it on, on a number of times now. Uh, I actually do this presentation at McNally Robinson um, in their community classroom and I've been asked to come back and do this um, at least a dozen times, maybe 15 times uh, over the last uh, two, three, two years, I guess. And um, uh, it is sold out every time. Uh, the classroom holds 32 people and every time it sells out. It just continually amazes me that it does that. Uh, but it, certainly there is uh, that interest for it. And I guess there's no shortage of people with knee injuries. And as we get a little older, I guess there's more, more and more aging knees. And uh, I'm starting to be able to identify with some of that as well. Um, <clears throat> the presentation that I, that I give um, at McNally's and this particular presentation is actually two hours long. So uh, we're going to try and condense this thing down into 30 minutes to try and keep it as short as possible so we can keep within the time frame and give you some opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, so the, the essence of the, uh, of the presentation is really to kind of give you some background information uh, about arthritis really, but I'm using the knee as an example. And it's um, uh, not meant to be a commercial, but I do also do the lectures on understanding back pain and, and hip pain uh, in much the same vein as what I do here. But the, the essence here is uh, I really want to kind of talk about what arthritis is um, and really bring you down into the medical, into the real medical aspect of it so that you get a real grasp of understanding this. I use the example of if you're looking at a clock and you look at the old clocks with the, the arms on them, not these digital things, but when you look at a clock and you see the long arm and the short arm and you look at that and you say, I know the time. But what you don't really understand is how does that actually work behind it? So if you took the face of the clock off and then all of a sudden you start to see all these gears moving around. And if you follow the gears, then it also all of a sudden starts to make sense how this clock actually works. And so that's the kind of thing that I would like to do here is really kind of important for you to understand the back room stuff of arthritis. And, and once you understand that, then you can say, make some decisions. So I know there's going to be some questions that are going to come out of this. I'm hoping that at the end of the day, uh, at the end of this lecture, that you will be able to answer those questions yourself based on some of this information that we're giving. So quickly, terminology. Um, the term arthritis, it's a Greek term, uh, and it's a, made up of Greek uh, 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 word phrases, and one is arthro. Arthro means joint, and itis means inflammation. So the, the generic term of arthritis just means I have a swollen knee. And anything that causes swelling of your knee really by definition is an arthritis. Um, but we've actually borrowed that term and we've changed some of it. And, and it seems to now take on this notion that I have degenerative changes in the knee, but essentially it really means anything that causes swelling in the knee, I have inflammation of the joint. And we're gonna look at what that inflammation really means. Now, um, the, uh, <clears throat> Causes of, our, of arthritis, this inflammation of the joint. Um, when we're talking about the arthritic changes happen, there are really two ways that that happens. One is rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid means, rheumo means blood borne. And so we're getting this inflammation or swelling in the joint or arthritis because of something that's within the blood system. And we also refer to this rheumatoid arthritis as an autoimmune disorder. And an autoimmune disorder simply means that for some reason or other, your immune system, your, your battle, your army within your system that fights off bacteria and viruses that we've heard so much about now in the last little while, that army, for some reason or other, 
now recognizes your joints, uh, the covering in your joint, as being foreign material. And it comes in and tries to kill it. It destroys it. Um, and so because it's this rumor, this, this, this um, um, uh, autoimmune this, this situation is within your blood system, that means it spreads to every joint of your body. So that's why we say that it attacks all joints. So a person who has rheumatoid arthritis, if you saw them, every knuckle in their hand would be affected. Both joints of their knees, their ankles, their shoulders, everything would be affected because of this. All right. Um, that's not what I want to talk to you about today. Um, the reason why is we don't fully understand why this is happening. We don't have a cure for it. And basically rheumatoid arthritis people, it's really just a matter of treating the symptoms for them. And that's using medications, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, this is not something that necessarily that we have a control over, but the other one, the next one, which is, which is referred to as um, osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis, we do have some control over. Uh, and osteo means bone. So arthro means joint, osteo means bone. And if it's involving the bones within a joint, we have det deterioration of the bones within a joint, the joint will react by swelling. And that now becomes the arthritis. So if we have deteriorating bone, it irritates, it causes an irritation inside the joint. And as we're going to see in a few minutes, the joint has the capacity to try and react to it by swelling. And it's a protective mechanism that we have. Now, osteoarthritis becomes joint specific. It's a wear and tear problem. It's an overuse problem. It's not this autoimmune thing that for some reason or other, your body turns on itself and starts to destroy every joint. No, the wear and tear happens because you've used a particular joint more than it more than it had capacity to. So it starts to wear away. Okay. So if you saw something, this is a knee joint. And this is you're looking at it on, on a on an X-ray, and you see this side of the joint. Look at you see that gap. We're going to look at this in more detail. But that gap there is actually filled with cartilage in your knee. Um, and so when I look at an x-ray, I go, well, that's a pretty, not a bad looking joint surface there. But if I look on the opposite side, whoops, whatever cartilage was supposed to be there is no longer there. And look at that bone and how that bone is deteriorated. Okay, so that's where we get this joint specific osteoarthritis or bone degeneration and causing the joint swelling. All right. Now, uh, as I said, that this type of arthritis, osteoarthritis is be comes because of overuse of that particular joint. So you can look at some of these things here. For example, if you are a carpenter and you're working on your knees all the time sawing, then you know your knees in this person, his knees are being stressed or they're being, um, uh, there's a stress being imposed on that knee far greater than someone who doesn't spend his, all his days on, on his knees. If you looked at, at, at this particular person, and this would be reminiscent of people who work in daycare, for example. Daycare people tell me that they have problems with their knees because they have to lower themselves to the height of the, of the, the clients, the children that they're working with. So they're always in this bent knee position, far more than you and I would be. Therefore, their knees may wear out faster. And the same thing here with a carpet layer. And if you know anything about carpet laying, this thing that he has right here, there's a, it's called a kicker. And um, it's what stretches the carpet. Well, in order to do that, he has to use, in this case, he'd be using his right knee and he would just be pounding on the end of that kicker to stretch it. Of course, now he's, he's violently stressing that knee joint far more than you and I would. And then this is culturally, in some countries, this is a position of how people sit. And um, so, you would think that these the people in this particular part of the world would have much more arthritic knee joints of their knee. And in fact, they don't. And the reason for it, why they don't, they don't is because uh, they've accommodated to this, to this type of position. They don't put as much strain on it for whatever reason. Now I put this one on the bottom page here, which is, which is the, uh, a skier. And I put that down to remind myself that not only do we do this damage to the joint of surfaces of the knee through 
per, uh, you know, ongoing, perceptive, progressive, persistent kind of stresses, we can also do it in one fell swoop. This skier is coming down the hill. They catch in, at the tip of the ski. The ski twists their knee and they twist and tear some ligament in their knee. And they also do damage to the, uh, to the uh, articular surface of the knee joint. And as we're going to see in a minute, um, they could now advance their osteoarthritis by years by just one foot, one, one injury. Okay. So um, this is going to be joint related specific. So the person here who's doing the carpet laying, they're getting arthritis of the knee, but there's nothing wrong with their shoulder or there's nothing wrong with their elbow, et cetera, because they're just not stressing at the same amount as opposed to that rheumatoid arthritis person who has it for, for everything. All right. So here's the essence of what's happening. We have this articular cartilage and uh, articular cartilage is really the essence of everything that we have. Here's our knee joint again. And uh, we have the, the top part of the knee. Uh, if, I don't know if you can see on a, on a camera uh, in this case here. Um, but if I have the knee joint here, let me see if I can see it. Okay. Uh, so this is the knee joint here like this and moving back and forth. And I have the kneecap sitting in front of it like this, all right? And so that's what you're looking at here, the ends of the joint. And then this, this gray surface that you have on the ends of the bones, this is called articular cartilage. Articular, because it's the cartilage that lines the articular surface or the portion where we have articulation between two bones. Two bone surfaces coming together. They're, and so in order to make sure that we don't have bone rubbing on bone, they're covered by this very, very thin but very, very smooth layer of cartilage. So it's very smooth tissue rubbing on very smooth tissue. In essence, trying to reduce friction, okay? The next time you have some chicken, take the leg bone, take the bone after you've eaten the chicken leg, go and look at the end of the chicken bone and you'll see this articular cartilage and try and scrape it off and see how silky smooth that, that cartilage is. It'll give you an idea of what we have at the end of our joints. So this is meant to be friction-free. We have, we have two nice, smooth, smooth surfaces. And if we minimize friction, then we minimize wear and tear. So this is here to spare the bone. Because if we have bone rubbing on bone, that would be like taking two rocks, rubbing those two rocks together, and you're just going to start to get powder happening because it's going to wear away. We don't want that to happen to our bones. Okay, so articular cartilage is there. And I'm going to bring you in and I'm going to show you a little bit about articular cartilage now. So what I've done here, this is a cross-sectional view. This is on a slide. I've taken this, the articular cartilage and uh, cut it uh, in cross-section. Now you're looking at the, this is the outermost portion. That would have been that gray portion you saw. And here's the bone underneath it, this portion right over here. Now the key to this slide here is that this cartilage, this lining, is I'm going to give you medical terms that you, you can walk into your doctor now and say, you know, I understand that such and such. Well, uh, articular cartilage is avascular. Avascular means it has no blood supply. Whenever we put that word A in front of something, means it's absent, has, doesn't have it. It has no blood supply. If it has no blood supply, it means that when you damage it, it can't heal. Your skin has lots of blood supply. When you cut your skin, you bleed. And when you bleed, you scab. And then when you scab, you heal. And it comes back and then you may have a scar, but the tissue the tissue has been healed. That's because you have blood supply. The cars line those bones, no blood supply. It means when you damage it, it doesn't repair. So this wear and tear that's happening with your knee is permanent. It doesn't repair itself, okay? The other part of this thing is that it's aneural. A, absent of, has, does not have it, means it has no nerve supply. No nerve supply means uh, we have a number of different types of nerves, but one of them is sensation to pain. These card, this cartilage has no sensation to pain. So again, if you were to cut your skin, lots of nerves there, you would, you would immediately feel pain and you would pull yourself away from it so you don't cause more pain to try and protect yourself. The cartilage has no nerve fibers. So you damage the nerve and you have no warning that it's happening. You don't stop. You continue on and you continue on to damage the joint, that, that cartilage. Okay, so 
If you're doing things that are over stressful, you're damaging it, not repairing it, and you're not even aware of it that it's happening until such time later on when we'll talk about where we get where we get this pain. So we get no advance warning and we don't get any damage. So this is why it's important to know about um, cartilage well ahead of time. Now, here's another slide that gives you a little bit more detail about the cartilage. And this gives you the components of cartilage. And chondrocytes, the word chondro means cartilage. Cytes means it's cells that produce cartilage. So it's these guys right in here, these little uh, uh, wormy-like things right in here. They're, those are what are called the chondrocytes and they're responsible for producing the cartilage that you have here. And you see, there's only a few of them throughout the whole area, but they just produce cartilage. The other one that I wanna show you is, is collagen fibers. About 10, 10 to 20% of the cartilage is made up of these collagen fibers. And those collagen fibers are these cross, hat, cross, cross hatches in the cartilage. And they, they essentially are there to, uh, to uh, they, they're a matrix, they're the, the structure of it. They're the scaffolding. If you think of a scaffolding around a building, that's what this is. That's what gives you the, 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 the structure, the skeleton of the cartilage. Um, and then we have what are called proteoglycans. And these are specialized cells inside of here. And I'll show you them in more detail in a second. But they're what we refer to as hydro philic hydro for water philic means it loves it it attracts it it it's like a magnet it wants water as opposed to being something that's got a phobia it's scared of it hydrophobic which means it means it would push water away this is hydrophilic it wants water okay so we have these all over inside this cartilage matrix and it's looking for water it's attracting water and in fact about 80% of our cartilage, 60 to 80% of the cartilage is in fact water. And that's the most important component because if we have, if this structure is full of water means it's spongy. And if it's spongy, it means it'll absorb shock. And so that means when you take these two bones and push them together, it's pushing two uh, bodies of water against each other and they're gonna absorb the shock and the blow is never going to get to the underlying bone. Okay, so it's there to protect that. And so that's why I say the cartilage is protecting the bone. So get, just remember the fact that this water is really, really important to maintain that. Okay, so now the other thing I wanted to show you, I wish I was quit doing that, is this joint lubrication. The other thing that we try and do to try and further minimize the, uh, the, the friction that's happening inside the joint is we we line the joint with a lubricating oil. So here's our joint again. There's our bone in yellow. The blue is that articular cartilage, okay? So it's articular cartilage full of water in there and it's got this matrix there. But we wanna, we wanna make this even more silky smooth. So we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, greet, we're gonna oil it with an oily uh, uh, fluid. And that oily fluid gets produced by this capsule around the whole knee and around every one of your joints, every knuckle in your hand, they have the same structure here. This is why I'm using the knee as an example, but it's true of every knuckle in your hand, of your ankle and uh, of your, of your uh, uh, shoulder, all of those joints are all the same makeup. Uh, but so we have this capsule around here and part of the capsule is really strong and it forms the ligaments, particularly on the sides of the knee. If you tear a ligament, usually you tear the ligaments on either the inside or the outside of the knee, and that's still part of the capsule. Uh, there are other ligaments inside the knee called the anterior cruciate ligaments that are deep inside the ligaments, and you've probably heard of people tearing the ACL ligaments, and that's a little bit different. Um, but the, in this context here, we have that. And then if you see right here on the inside of that joint, you see this sort of this light brown membrane on both sides that wraps around the whole envelope of the knee and it's called the synovial membrane. And that synovial membrane secretes what we call synovial fluid. Synovial fluid has the consistency of 1020 motor oil. So if you think about it, it's this sort of this yellow oily film to it. And this stuff is what produces that and that falls into the middle of the joint 
and lines the articular cartilage so we have even more friction-free uh, movement of the joint. And this is the reason why you normally should be able to get 70, 80, even 90 years of movement of this joint without any, without uh, significant wear and tear. It's designed to be friction free, okay? Um, if you've ever heard of a water on the knee, people have water on the knee, it usually means that uh, that's what's happening here is that the knee joint has been insulted. It's had, it's gotten a trauma. It's been, it's torn a ligament or it has something inside the joint that's irritating it. And so this membrane um, will go into overdrive. It will say, I need to do something to help out my knee and it'll start to overproduce fluid and cause the, the, the knee to become swollen. In fact, what it is, is it's, it's its natural cast. I fill this knee joint up with fluid and now the knee can't move. And it, won't, it will stay that way until whatever is inside that knee repairs itself. Now we've done, we, we say, well, let's take that away and we pull the fluid out and then we put you into a brace. But the body does its own bracing if you want it, if you're left to do it, okay? Which is an interesting sort of thing. So we've got this friction-free system happening there. Now, one other problem we have is that if the, blood, if the cartilage has no blood supply, how does it get its nutrition? Because every other part of your body, your muscles, your bones, and everything else get nutrition delivered to it by your, by your blood system. How does this get its nutrition? How do those chondrocytes get to nutrition? And also, how, does it, how do they get rid of their byproduct of, of uh, toxic waste. Um, that, the, that happens uh, through a, a uh, mechanical effect. So it's not blood supply going through. It requires movement. We mean mechanical effect means movement. And this next slide kind of shows you what it does. So if this is the cartilage in here, and this is my, the bone above it. So if I'm saying this thing here, I'm looking at the the bottom part of my joint here, and then the top is my the bone here rubbing on the cartilage. When, when the bone moves, this condyle moves over, what it does is it, it's in this case here, it's, whoops, darn it, it's squishing the fluid out of the cartilage. So wherever water is in there, it squishes it. But on the other hand, on this side, the arrows here are, if I were, were to reverse the motion, then this side here would be pushing fluid into the cartilage. So the fact that these bones are moving one on top of the other on their cartilage, it's pushing fluid out. So all the toxic stuff is being moved out, but it's also pushing fluid in, which is how it gets its nutrition, okay? So we're starting to talk going down the plane here that if you wanna provide nutrition and want healthy cartilage, this joint has to move because it's the only way it can get nutrition, okay? Um, all right, so one other thing I wanna bring out on, on the cartilage is the, the effect of aging. So as we get older, the, the thought is that th the cartilage changes just by virtue of age. Now I'm gonna put a little bit of caveat on that, but one of the things that we know happens is that when you get older, those chondrocytes, those cells that are there, that, that are supposed to be there to make um, um, a, a cartilage, they increase in size, but they decrease in activity. So they don't make as much cartilage anymore. So we're not replacing cartilage anymore. Uh, and in a young person, then we're manufacturing lots. But as we get older, we make less and less of it. The other thing is the proteoglycans, uh, get, uh, we get less and less of them. Now, I'm going to show you the proteoglycan. This is what's inside that matrix. It's sitting in the water. It's a specialized protein structure. And it has structures, you may, you may hear of this, hyaluronic acid, chondroitin sulfate. If you've heard of chondroitin sulfate or glucose, uh, glucosamine, um, that's what's in here. And you some of you may be already taking glucosamine or hyaluronic acid or chondroitin sulfate. You're taking that as a medication. We can talk about that a little bit more later if you want. But in essence, we have that in our body already. And that's what's the hydrophilic component of the brain, of the cartilage. That's what causes, what is attracting this water. So these proteoglycans, proteo means, means protein, glycan is, a, is just a sugar. So it's a combination of proteins and sugar molecules. 
that come together and they attract water. And so they're sitting inside that matrix. And here's what you have in a newborn. Look at how much in that particular card, look at all of the protein, these little strands, it's full of it. So a newborn, a brand new cartilage is really full, full of water because it's got all these proteoglycans that are just attracting it. So it's nice, healthy, thick, spongy cartilage. It's there to take on the world. Um, and an older, like a mature person, so we're talking middle age, um, you've probably lost 50% of them, which means now potentially you have 50% you have less water in the cartilage and fit, potentially less 50% less compressive capacity to, to the cartilage. Therefore, you may potentially have more breakdown. And in the so-called elder, elderly, uh, even that much less. Okay, now the, only, the caveat I'm gonna put on this is the studies that we have here have been done from the past generation. And uh, we're of the baby boomer generation and most of us of this generation are much more active physically exercise related. And I don't mean labor related, but much more physically really, uh, cognizant of our activities than our last generation are. And so this might all just be a factor of disuse. And it's just the old notion that if you don't use it, you lose it. And so if people are much more sedentary, then the body will just recognize and say, well, I don't need this amount because I, you're not putting, I don't have any stress on it, so I don't need it, I'll lose it. But if you're continually active, you may be forestalling some of this de 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 degeneration. All right, so um, this is the, what happens now. If you look at an osteoarthritic problem, you get wear and tear, and here's what happens. You wear and tear that cartilage. And now what you've done is you've torn a piece of cartilage right down to the bone. So this cartilage is, is, um, has no wear, and has no uh, nerve fibers, no muscle fibers, can't heal itself, doesn't have any pain, but that underlying bone, huge, uh, lots of blood supply, lots of nerve supply. And now you weren't being warned before, but now you're being told, this is painful and it's very painful. And what will then happen as you progress on and on, what damaged here will now ca cause bone chips to happen here. Those bone chips will migrate over to this side of the joint, destroy your cartilage on that side. And now you have this massively uh, degenerated joint with all of these blood vessels and all these nerve fibers in the bone that are just giving you debilitating pain and loss of function. And at this point in time, then there's not a lot you can do. And so here's this x-ray again, another x-ray of a normal knee. X-rays don't show cartilage. So they show the space where the cartilage is. And so what I look at is a nice big space. And I also look at the bone. I say, look at that bone, nice clear distinction, nice clear lines. That bone is not very active. Over here, space over here, but not near, nowhere near as much as a normal knee. Look at over here, completely gone. And look at that bone. And I'm just gonna, gonna do this so I can bring it up. Uh, oops, I did a stop share. Um, let's share that one more time. Uh, just so I can bring it up so you can see it a little bit better. See, look at the bone, how it's all deteriorated. Uh, no cartilage there anymore. And this is a very, very, very painful joint. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we want to be able to, to avoid. Um, let's go to the next slide. All right, so the uh, so I'm giving you a kind of a whirlwind tour of what happens to degeneration. What do you do about it? Well, there are lots and lots of options. There is medication that you can do. Uh, I, I always put a, a rider on pet, pain medication because when you watch these commercials and they say the person cannot walk and things, and all of a sudden they take painkillers and now they're all playing frisbee. Uh, th that painkillers and anti-inflammatories mask the symptoms, they take away your protective mechanism. So if you are taking painkillers or anti-inflammatories, that's not, doesn't mean you just go back to your normal activity that caused all the problem in the first place. You've got to find some way of modifying that because you can't continue to take medication because of the side effects that it'll cause, okay? You can go to a brace. There are a host of different braces on the market now that actually spread out. So if you look at this particular brace, look at that side of the knee, how it's collapsed. You put the brace on and now you gap it again. And that can give you 
six months to a year to two years of relief and allow you to still continue to play. And these are some of the braces that allow you to get back to your quality of life. So that's an option. Uh, then, they, then you can go to what's called a debridement. This is a surgical technique. They'll go in and they'll clean up all the bones and shave the cartilage down. And that this usually gives you six months or so of relief, um, but it's, a, it's very short term. And then ultimately you go to a full knee replacement. And this is where now we cut that joint, the, the joint, the bones off both of them, and we give you a, a metal one. Um, obviously this is, we're doing a lot, lot more of this. And thankfully for people who have all this excruciating pain now have a, 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 an alternative but this is not giving you the full quality of life. Uh, this knee joint is not the same. We have not been able to manufacture the same thing that God has made, that this knee joint is, just doesn't do the same thing. For example, a normal knee will give you 135 degrees flexion. A, a, a artificial one will give you between 120 and 125. So if you think you wanna go down and kneel down in your garden with this knee, you're not gonna do it, okay? So that's the kind of an example. It's just not the same. You want to avoid this if you can, but if you need it, it's there. A couple of things coming out in the future. Oh, actually, this is here now to some degree that we can actually clone some of your own cartilage and put it back in and patch it, but uh, it's limited to the size. So you've got a tear here. They take some of your cartilage, they put it into the, the beakers and they clone them. And then they put them into a Petri dish and they grow a new piece of cartilage and they bring it and they patch it into the cartilage. And this regenerates and grows back again. So this is a, a new thing in the last four or five years. Uh, it's limited to size right now because of how big we can make these patches. But it, it's something that's going to come down the pipe. This is another technique that's called platelet rich, pla platelet, platelet rich plasma, PRP. And the plasma in your blood, blood has a, um, we don't fully understand why this happens. But if you take your blood, centrifuge it, take all the red blood cells, take all the white blood cells, everything else out, take your platelets and re-inject it into the joint. It seems to stimulate healing and recovery. And we don't fully understand that yet, but it's under intense research. And so this is another option to having that happen. Uh, the newest thing that's gonna be coming out is stem cell therapy. And stem cell therapy in the next five to 10 years is gonna revolutionize medicine. So potentially we can take a, one of your cells, a stem cell from your other, your bone marrow or your fat, and we can say, we want you to become cartilage and inject it in your knee. It'll go to the site of inflammation and it'll make new, new cartilage for you. This may be the newest thing that might happen that may replace our uh, uh, surgery. But having said all of that, I wanted to give you that. Here's the golden rule. This is, it's regular exercise, prevention. So we wanna, we wanna avoid having to take medication, having surgeries, having braces. We wanna avoid that if we can. And that means providing our cartilage with good nutrition. And now I don't have to tell you uh, what the answer to this answer, question is. How do I get more nutrition to my, to my cartilage? It's exercise. And the, if you use weight-bearing exercise, much, much better than non-weight-bearing exercise. So it would be the exercise of choice. So walking uh, to some degree, running, but certainly walking, uh, that this compressive load and pushing this fluid in and out of the cartilage providing the nutrition for the cartilage will keep it healthy. Hydration will be important. Make sure you're hydrated because this cartilage is 60 to 80% fluid. So having, don't dehydrate yourself because you will draw blood, uh, water away from there to your more important organs. It'll just say, I don't need it as my, in my cartilage as much as I need it in my liver and in my kidneys and my muscle structure. So it'll pull it away. So hydration is important. Uh, if you can't do non-weight-bearing exercises, then weight bearing, non-weight-bearing exercises are the next best thing because you have joint motion. You may not have the compressive load, but you do have joint motion. So cycling and water exercises are good things, okay? Um, strengthening, having good strength around the joints so that you, you stabilize those joints so that make sure that the joints move, are protected, and they're, they're, they're moving in the proper sequence. Um, a uh, uh, plane so that you're not wearing, tearing one side of the knee or, or the other. For example, most people have what we refer to as medial osteoarthritis. The inside of the knee joint is, it, it becomes arthritic more than the outside because of the fact that our knees collapse inwardly. So having your knee joints good and strong and muscles there is really important. And, and the other is having uh, flexibility. 
lots and lots of flexibility uh, to make sure that the muscles are strong, are, are long, long, and you have good, efficient motion going up and down stairs, getting in and out of your car, etc. You have the proper flexibility to do it efficiently. Okay. Um, uh, I, I put this one in a, a calf board. I have this little thing because I really strongly believe that most people don't stretch the calves nearly a, a, a enough. So if you want to have a a, 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 how to build one, I can give you that. And I can also send you some exercise on how to do this. I can also, if you want uh, exercises for either flexibility or stretching, I can send you web-based exercise. All you got to do is, is email me. Um, balance is also critically important for the older population. Um, again, we don't, we, we're so afraid of falling that we stay away from uh, precarious situations. And it's just, again, if you don't use it, you lose it. You lose the awareness of where your joints are. So do this in non-threatening things. Doing a stretch stand. When you're brushing your teeth in the morning, put one hand on the counter and the other in your mouth and stand on one leg and close. And if you can do that really well, do the same thing with your eyes closed. And then try and lift your hand away from the counter to try and maintain your balance. Balance is critical, okay? It's the number one reason why we fall because we have poor balance. But balance is not something that's inevitable that you're going to lose. It's if we lose it because we don't use it. Okay. So again, if you want something there, you can do that. So doing one-legged exercises uh, with balance. Uh, initially, you start with your eyes open, and when you get good at your eyes open, you do it with the eyes closed. You'll be amazed at how hard it is to do it with your eyes closed. Okay. So again, it's just another way of being able to to, to develop that. And at the end of the day, uh, after all that talking. Here's my last slide. And I have no answer for this one, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so I, I hope I finished okay time, a little bit late, but if there's any questions. It was great considering you uh, normally take, you were great for time, Dr. Bergeron. <laughs> I'll just see if anybody has any questions again, like normal, we use the chat box on the bottom. So if you have anything, you can enter it in there. Um, lots of really good information. Uh, lots of good reminders for me. I felt like I was back in university at some part of points of <laughs> terminology and stuff, jog my memory. So that was great. Um, and great information, hopefully for everybody to know that now we know kind of what's going on in our knee and what's important and uh, I enjoyed the comment of keeping nutrition, good nutrition for our cartilage. We often think of nutrition as energy for everything else, but we need to do movement that requires nutrition. So I'm just going to see. So some positive comments there, just thanking uh, for the very great and clear presentation. So thanks, Rosanna. Check my... Uh, I should uh, I should leave this on if anybody has any questions afterwards or if they want anything uh, information there's my email address that you can send it to. Um, Dr. Bergeron what's your thoughts on glucosamine? Uh, <laughs> okay um, I I actually talked about that in the in the expanded lecture and okay. I took the, I took the slides out um, but let me let me see if I can put them back in if you don't mind just uh, bear with me for just a second. Because uh, uh, um, where are they? Hang on a second. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll um, unhide this one. I took them out of the slide just because I, I didn't think I was going to be able to get to it. But in terms of questions, um, uh, so glucosamine chondroitin sulfate, uh, the, the um, bottom line on it is that there is inconclusive evidence. Um, there, uh, there really isn't a lot of, uh, of uh, evidence that shows that it works. Now, every time I do that, I say that I, when I do this presentation, I ask people to put their hands up and say, how many of you have taken glucosamine? And usually a third to half the class will have taken it. And then I ask how many of you um, uh, find that it works? 
and usually five to 10% of them say it works and the other people say, I don't know. And so the, this has been an ongoing debate and the, the uh, supplement industry, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And so the CDC um, a few years ago uh, wanted to sort of settle the answer. So in 2006, the CDC did a $12 million study. They brought in 1600 subjects and they did it over 24 weeks. And they evaluated them in terms of, they, they looked at actual measurements of different, the size of the cartilage. They looked at the person's pain. They looked at their medication. They looked at their function. Um, and they found that uh, there was no difference between the people who took glucosamine and, those, and the people who took a placebo. And a placebo will be a pill that's a sugar pill, essentially. And so between the two of them, there was no difference after 24 weeks. In fact, they expanded it on into, I think, six months. And there was no difference between the two of them in, in any of the parameters. All right. And uh, so, but one of the things they did find that in the placebo group, 60% of the people who took the sugar found that it helped. And so uh, this goes to speak to this whole notion of placebo, that research typically accepts a 20% placebo thing. So that just the fact that you are suggesting something to somebody, they will get better. Now, I'm not saying that it's, it's a, a negative thing. It is part and parcel that people will get better. One of the things that you, uh, uh, and I go into this in some other lectures that I do, but the human body makes every uh, medication known to man. So as I said, it already makes glucosamine it always ready make chondroitin sulfate. And sometimes what happens is, is that the manufacture of this is being slowed down because the energy that you would normally use for that is being used for something else. And that something else is normally stress or other illnesses and disease. And so um, if you give something to somebody and they truly believe that this is gonna get better, they can essentially, um, engage their own intrinsic, their in, what we call their endogenous system, and it'll work for itself. So in this case here, normal research, we accept a 20% placebo as being normal. This one was three times that. 60% of the people felt that they got relief from taking the sugar pill. Um, so it, it tells you really sort of what's really been effective here. So that's why I say to people who come in and say, look, I take it. I swear by it, it's made all the difference in the world. I'll tell them, you continue to do that. I have no idea why it's happening. I know that the evidence doesn't show that that chondroitin sulfate is actually making its way to your cartilage that you're taking in your stomach, but it's working, keep on going. Because there's no side effects, there's no downside to taking it, except that it's costing you money. Those people who say that, um, I don't know whether it works or not, I say, stop taking it and monitor your effect. And if after you after a week or two or th uh, three weeks you find that your knee pain comes back, take it again, and then you know. If it doesn't make any difference, stop spending your money on it. Uh, since that study has been done in the last of 2008 to 2016, there have been seven other studies that I found, and all of them have said the same thing: no difference in the placebo. All right, so that's sort of that answer to glucosamine. But at the same time, if you say, you know what? It's helping me, I feel better with it. I say, continue doing it. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Good. So there's a couple other that came from some of the participants. So just wondering if you could comment on an injection recommended for the knee joint. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there are a couple of uh, different types of, um, of injections. There are, one of them is called Synvisc and the other one I keep forgetting the name right now. But um, essentially what they are is injecting a gel into the joint. And it acts like uh, what, what that synovial fluid was supposed to act like in, in providing you some, with some additional lubrication. It's usually thicker uh, because if, if the synovial fluid would be too fluidy for you to overcome all the roughness that you have in the joint. Um, so you inject it. Used to be, you have to, used to have two injections. Now you only have to have one. Um, it's a cost of about $300, I think, now. It's not covered under Manitoba Health. And it, it's about um, 60 to 80% effective with people um, and usually gives you six months to a year 
of relief. And you can repeat them if you wanted to. So if you're a person who has arthritic knees and arthritis in your knee joint, uh, and you are waiting to have a knee replacement, this is a reasonable thing to try because you're going to be waiting 18 months, 12 to 18 months for your surgery. And if you're in this dire pain now, this may give you some relief and, and extend your quality of life until you, until you get your surgery. So I would talk to your physician about doing it. I do know some people who have had adverse reactions to them. Uh, I know people who have, it hasn't helped them at all. So I can't give you a guarantee either way. Uh, one last question, I think, and it's about fish oil supplements and if you have heard if they're helpful or not. For yeah, again, the, the, the jury is out. The, the, there's this contradictory uh, research in there. Um, it's like saying there's also people who do shark, uh, shark cartilage as well uh, as part of their nutritional supplement. And um, there, there really isn't... Um, um, good evidence to say, yes, you should be doing that. Okay. But at the same time, this is the same thing. Um, if you're taking it and you say it's helpful, I'm not going to say stop taking it, continue on. But if it, if you're taking it, it you don't seem to notice a difference, then you be your own experiment. Stop taking it and see if it makes a difference or not. Okay. So there's a couple more comments, just thanking you for the presentation. And I think we'll just be respectful of your time. So you've had a busy day teaching classes and it's uh, into the evening. So just wanna thank you again for sharing all that information and maybe we'll have you present another time on a, a different topic. It sounds like you've got lots of uh, great topics already ready to go. So thank you everybody else for joining in. Um, next week, we have a couple more presentations. Um, I can't think of them off the top of my head. I apologize, but we will be putting them on our website for sure. Um, so you can join in and uh, make sure that you keep doing your videos online uh, through the refit at anywhere uh, site and keep active and keep your knees nice and healthy. Have a good night, everybody.